Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on the Federal News Network. We are talking about uh, IT healthcare uh, across the, uh, the entire uh, country, quite frankly. And uh, we're going to roll it over to uh, Cara at ServiceNow. And uh, we've heard a lot about uh, different agencies interacting with each other, a lot of telemedicine, et cetera. What's going on at ServiceNow to uh, enable all this? Sure. So we're working with um, different healthcare executives and administrators across you know, the different visions. Um, I support the VA. And we're finding that healthcare staff safety and veteran experience is really one of the top concerns and priorities. Um, if we take COVID, for example, the hospital staff members no longer have, you know, are working longer hours and are really on the front lines of patient care. So they don't have the luxury of pushing around carts from room to room. They need to be able to push and receive data at their fingertips using their mobile devices or, or issued devices. Um, so one of our customers over on the, pro on the private side, <clears throat> They really wanted us to come in and examine, you know, how they can change that patient experience and get the patients to engage more with the hospital staff and find some alternative ways to inject technology. Um, so from the patient perspective, we're entering that digital age where they can order food or request medications or even, you know, um, uh, turn a channel, the room channel on their TV um, from their, just using Alexa, for, you know, from their remote. And then on the clinician side, uh, we have, you know, the clinicians that have those issued devices, they can actually stop the blood pressure or temperature machines from beeping. I'm, I'm sure you visit someone in the hospital and you hear that annoying beeping in the background. Now they can just use their device to turn that off. Um, or they can even reassign a task or request from a patient um, to a nurse that's within that location, just to, again, to enhance that patient experience. Yeah, it sounds like uh, not only the patient experience, but the clinician experience as well, and just a, a better workflow across the spectrum, which is fantastic. I'm glad to see that uh, that, that technology has been introduced. Ben, uh, we, uh, we've been talking about emerging technologies all morning. What's happening at Red Hat, and how do they sort of fit into this emerging technology ecosystem? Yeah, uh, you know, as already mentioned, uh, COVID-19 has really compounded the existing infrastructure problems in healthcare systems. And uh, patient overflow at a hospital isn't just an issue for resource constraints. Uh, the underlying systems also have to scale to meet demand. Um, and the, the continued adoption of technologies with smaller and smaller footprints has really started to show its value in this time. So allowing for massive scaling events to meet that demand. Um, that same technology is also being used to rapidly build out field hospitals and gyms, parks, and ships for real-time flow of healthcare data. Um, and these small footprints leverage edge technologies, like John mentioned, to produce insights at the site of care, uh, no matter how remote they might be. Um, a fine example can be found with, uh, there's a large healthcare provider uh, in, in uh, I think it's like the Southeast that created a sepsis prediction and optimization therapy pr uh, platform. It, uh, it collects and analyzes clinical data and signal caregivers in real time to initiate uh, early sepsis care. Uh, they used uh, open source software to create a scalable container-based platform as a service. And the group also uses uh, automation management analytics software to support real-time data collection, analysis, and proactive case management. Um, it's really like exciting to see that type of technology being applied anywhere, but there are many active programs across the federal healthcare agencies that are using similar approaches. Uh, and, you know, it's really exciting just to be a part of any of that. Um, everyone, you know, on this panel and everyone listening are patients and, you know, the broader the adoption of proven innovative technologies, the greater the impact to the quality and duration of our lives. Certainly, uh, healthcare is important to all of us, our families, our friends, our colleagues, et cetera. And I love the multimodal example that you gave there. Uh, let's get into a specific program that's been uh, super successful. So uh, let's start with you, Bill. Can you give us an example of a, a program that you all have, are working on or have already implemented that's really been a success as far as uh, you know, the implementation of healthcare across the uh, community? Well, I'd, I'd rather talk about what we're doing extensive a portfolio instead of a program. I sometimes think that we, we draw arbitrary boundaries around 
our programs. And so what we're managing at DHMS, and frankly, as we move forward in conjunction with the Coast Guard and the VA, part of the Federal Electronic Health Record Modernization Office, is the delivery of capabilities, IT capabilities to support um, VA, DOD, and, and, and uh, Coast Guard, and, and potentially other federal uh, uh, healthcare providers across the full spectrum, right? So we put a lot of focus on uh, upfront on getting the electronic health record, uh, MHS Genesis, and the shared implementation with, with VA and Coast Guard deployed. So DOD has, you know, we started a few years ago. I, I think we really started back in 15. We did some initial, initial sites. You may recall there were some observations that it was not perfect at our initial sites. We learned a lot from that. Sure. Uh, this past September, we went to four sites uh, in what we called Wave Travis, which was tremendously successful. Um, so we have eight sites running. When COVID happened and we all had to look at things differently, what we found, what we observed was, and I talked a little bit about this earlier, is that where we had deployed the modern EHR, that we were, we enabled the healthcare providers to be more adaptable, more resilient, and more responsive to the changing unknown future needs and changing needs of responding to COVID, new COVID tests, how to order them, things like that. Where we had the new system in place, the new capabilities in place, we were able to make those changes inside a day, actually in less than a half a day, get the updates to training out there and, and clinically have people prepared to use them, uh, providers prepared to use them. Where we were dealing with the legacy environments, it took months to get the same thing accomplished. So very exciting. And I talked earlier about how we were able to pull back the operational, pullbacks may be a poor choice, but use the operational medicine technologies that we generally used with deployed forces, right? Uh, think, you know, Afghanistan, people might be using it there. Low bandwidth, and so the, the, the 5G and the, the Verizon talk was very relevant there because we're shifting to all network delivered capabilities and, and data. Um, but pull those capabilities back. Um, provide our, our, our operational medical situational awareness capabilities to CONUS so that we can get insight into how be where, where beds are, where beds are available, where PPE is, and, and what the situation is in the military health system and how it all ties together uh, and ties back to the record. And then also take that same set of technology, the operational uh, medicine technologies, and apply it to delivering care in non-traditional environments, right? Going back to the data conversation, we're collecting this data. We have a very rich uh, uh, and very broad collection of data about people, um, about patients. How do we get that to where the care needs to be delivered? And where care needs to be delivered has shifted. Our, our whole understanding of that has shifted away from the traditional fixed medical center that, 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 that people are accustomed to, and we talked about that a little up front, and, and we need to be more flexible because of COVID. And as we go through the COVID, we realize there are other advantages to it, and we're open to, to creating the capability to do that more broadly. You got to meet the patients where they are, and I love the example of sort of iterating and uh, learning and evolving is uh, a fantastic example of, of um, you know, improving the, uh, the ecosystem. Cara, let's go over to you at ServiceNow, and uh, you gave uh, an example, or you mentioned uh, that you're working with the VA. Give us a specific example of a program that you've been working on uh, that's been uh, perhaps wildly successful. So I'll give you, um, one of the things I wanted to share was um, the fact that we work with the state of Washington, and we're starting to work more with the VA now, but I don't have a specific um, example for you. But we worked with the state of Washington when COVID first struck and we built these applications over, you know, the course of three days. And really it was emergency response and assigning staff and resources to support the emergency, uh, COVID being COVID, distributing information, so emergency outreach, um, self-reporting so that employees could say, hey, I feel sick, I'm not really ready to return to work, and somehow notifying their managers, you know, of their, of their um, um, uh, illness and then in emergency exposure management. So this is where they're identifying and managing exposure risk so that they don't expose their patients or you know, other staff members. Um, we, did, we deployed those applications in March and then we piggybacked on those applications and built you know, six more um, so that we, to release to our customers. And what we found uh, during this time period was our customers wanted, like Jose mentioned, some more dashboards and analytics so that they can track some of the trends um, and kind of isolate some of those cases. Uh, workplace safety was another application that we rolled out. 
PPE inventory. We worked with a number of hospitals that were trying to track some of the, you know, PPE equipment that were, you know, it, it, you can remember it was just scarce, right? So now doctors and uh, clinicians can check in and check out uh, inventory. In addition to employees that are starting to transition back into the workplace, they can, you know, be assigned, you know, PPE uh, in, uh, equipment. Contact tracing. Um, we started this, you know, for one of our, uh, you know, private sector companies and what they wanted to do was try to figure out or, or pinpoint who was in the meeting rooms together. How can we isolate that group and keep those folks at home so that they do not spread the, you know, spread the virus to other members of their team. And then the last application was facilities management. Where do we need to go and sterilize and clean? Which rooms, you know, may have, you know, caused some, some, some of this illness to spread? Um, um, and so we can kind of deploy the crew to go and clean these rooms. So yeah, these applications were built, as I mentioned, over the course of three days. And then we had, you know, a tiger team building these additional applications for other hospitals that we support in the private sector. Outstanding, uh, real-time accurate information, which is uh, crucial uh, in a situation like, uh, like this. Shermender, how about over at VA? Can you give us an example of a specific program you'd like to highlight? Yeah, I think I want to, I want to, um, uh, you know, kind of build on what Bill was talking about. Bill mentioned the firm, uh, the Federal Health Electronic Records Management Office. That's a joint DOD VA construct. It's helping to guide the implementation of the single integrated electronic health record for patients, a patient centric view. Uh, I think by, by most accounts, this is the largest IT project in government. Uh, the partnership with DOD is incredible. A specific aspect that's in my lane is around data management, right? As we go through this transition, whether it's DHA transitioning, whether it's on the VA side, you know, on the VA side in particular, we're going to be dual operations with Vista and, and the um, Cerner Millennium for a number of years, right, as we go through the cutover. Uh, so it's, it's, it, it gives us an incredible impetus to dramatically mature our data management capabilities, our data governance capabilities, the tooling and instrumentation we use to support that, how we do requirements management, right, to make sure that we are uh, not missing a beat as we're operating on the VA side, an uh, integrated healthcare system, and uh, the same on the DOD side. Um, you know, re related to this, and this is, uh, I think, a an important angle on uh, health IT is this idea of veterans experience, right? Customer experience, uh, veterans experience was, was mentioned earlier. And, you know, every veteran starts out as a service member, right? So it's really the service members veterans experience as a continuum. And in that lens, we're working really closely with our counterparts in DOD, me with my uh, counterpart, David Spurks, the chief data officer. Uh, and then under a construct called the joint executive committee, which is co-chaired by the Deputy Secretary over in VA and the Undersecretary for Personnel and Readiness over in DOD. We're working on a joint data and analytics strategy, you know, building out on this idea of a, you know, a, a service member veterans journey. Uh, you know, so you, you got the electronic health record, but then you got the rest of the story, right? The core identification information, service information, right? To be able to treat the veteran, treat the customer as a whole person, over their lifetime, right? So that's sort of the vision that we're trying to work towards. Right, through that entire ecosystem, just like a civilian wants to have, you know, their, their records go from, you know, doctor to doctor, the same sort of thing. Uh, I would imagine that we would uh, want to experience there from service uh, to uh, uh, migrating over to a veteran. Uh, John, how about over at Verizon? Can you give us a specific example of a program that you'd like to highlight? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to I want to build on a little bit of what uh, Shemina was just talking about around veteran experience. You know, we've worked very closely with the Office of Connected Care uh, over the last couple of years. And, you know, when you think about a veteran, w one of the, the challenges in many cases they have is they live, you know, many, many miles or hours away from, you know, the closest uh, either hospital or clinic location. And so what we have been really working to do is to provide connectivity and remote telehealth solutions to those veterans. Uh, and have really worked to deploy, you know, thousands of, uh, of tablet solutions uh, so that veterans can receive care in their home. Uh, they're able to connect back to the VA through the VA Video Connect app. They can have uh, individual session with their clinician, with their doctor. They can uh, connect with other veterans. They can, uh, you know, access many, many resources. 
uh, across the uh, the platform that the VA offers. And so instead of you know spending hours in a car or coming into a crowded hospital, they're able to get that health care uh, right in their homes. We've also done some work for folks that maybe don't have access to that tablet-based type solution, and we've eliminated any charges, if you will, for utilization of data on their smartphone. Uh, so veterans or anyone really can connect through the application, uh, again, to connect back to the VA, uh, have a, a video conference with their doctor, and do that without uh, incurring any data charges. So you know, we're really working, I think, to enable uh, these these platforms to uh, extend their reach and, and really uh, you know, leverage the Verizon network to be able to to connect uh, folks all across the country and provide that critical care that they need. So uh, some really good partnership with the, uh, the VA. That is outstanding. I'm sure every uh, veteran certainly does appreciate that. Uh, let's go over to Mark. Uh, Mark, can you give us an example of a program that you'd like to highlight uh, um, in regards to what's happening over there at HHS? Sure. You know, we're very lucky at ONC, uh, the Office of the National Coordinator, because we have so many great programs that are under the works. But let me, let me talk about the program for programs, and that is the ONC Tech Lab. Uh, and actually, it's at healthit.gov forward slash tech lab. And basically, if, if people out there in the private sector or the research sector or nonprofits have a project that they're thinking of working on that they think is a really great idea in the, in the healthcare space, they can submit a project, um, they, they can do a project submission on that website. And then that way, it, it allows for other organizations to you know, possibly collaborate, to make sure there's not a duplication in effort. Uh, after all, we are the national coordinator, so this is a way for us to coordinate great projects that are out there. And I'm sure all of you have seen that, you know, with the COVID pandemic, there are all kinds of folks that have said, hey, I've got this really, really great idea for a project that will really help in, in the COVID space. So we have a place where we can send them to so that they can, again, submit the, their project and, and talk about it and collaborate and and if there are other people that are that are you know working on something similar they can collaborate and it it really has had some really great results we've had over 100 project submissions so far fantastic uh didn't even realize that there was a program like that and i'm glad there's uh been such a wide uh, amount of um, participation all right we're going to take another short break and uh, we'll be right back you're listening to the federal executive forum on the federal news network <laughs> 